Okay, so today is lesson four already. Wow, four of 12, time is flying along. So we just did a little uh, collaborative exercise trying to get a sense of how people are doing and feeling today. So feel free to go ahead and add a photo or sticky note to the board. The link was in the chat. And it's also on D2L in your lesson four folder. To share a photo that shows how your day is going, it'll open you, jump you, and let you enter the board as a guest. So feel free to add some content. I'll probably clear this out later because we may use this board for some other collaborative activities later on in the semester. All right, so let's have a look at what we're gonna do today. Lesson's kind of be, gonna be broken up a little bit. Um, I'm gonna give you assignment one, it's due next week. Um, I think a week is reasonable because you have to build three pages. So you have to build two tables in your MySQL database and three PHP pages, which I think is pretty reasonable. Um, we're gonna look at implementing both client and server-side validation and you'll have to do that in your assignment. And then we're gonna do a quick review of uh, Git and GitHub. I know that you guys have been working with it already. I know from talking to Jarrett that you already had an assignment you had to post, um, but I'm gonna go over, just review a few things. Um, Cause I think Jarrett mostly showed you how to do it within IntelliJ, if memory serves. Uh, I wanna show you old school Git where you have a lot more control and it's not that way you're not sort of reliant on your development environment. And that's just using your, your Windows command prompt or your Mac terminal. So we're going to go over that. And I'm going to also show you a few, Git re, a few resources um, if you're struggling with Git, because we are going to um, hammer you guys with Git. Jarrett will, I will, Tom will, and some of your other instructors. By the time you guys uh, are finished, you are going to be experts in using Git and GitHub. So we'll go over that as well again today. So let's have a look. I wanna have a look at assignment one. It's posted on D2L under assignments. And I'll just open up my copy. We can go over it and I'm happy to answer any questions. I also was happy to see um, most, almost everybody did the, the week three quiz, which is great. Um, class average is 83%, which I'm happy about. Um, tells me, you know, there's a little bit of challenge in the quiz, but it's certainly not inappropriately difficult, which is good. And I got most submissions from lab one, got about 15 of them yesterday, but another 15 today. So about 80% of the class did lab one. Uh, it's kind of interesting to see Read about your families, who see who your siblings and your pets are, learn a bit about what some of your parents do for a living. Uh, lots of IT professionals, lots of teachers, interestingly enough, um, among your, among your, in your families. Uh, so I've marked those already, so you should have your mark and uh, that would already be posted to D2L. Um, okay, and this is just taking me a second to get my assignment open. Bear with me. We'll try. Right again. Um, all right, well, Word doesn't seem to want to open it up for me, so I will go about this another way. If at first you don't succeed, try something different. Okay, there we go. Sorry about the delay. So your assignment is due next Monday. 
at five o'clock. It's worth 15% of your grade. Please submit two things on D2L. You need to submit a link to your private, a private repository. You can call it Comp 1006 AS1. Here's my GitHub username, IFOTN, stands for in front of the net. And um, I will review how to make sure you invite me to the repository. Your repository must be private. If it's public, I'm not gonna mark it. And you may be subject to a misconduct because you've now published your work, your source code for anyone else in the class to take. Okay, so it has to be private. So you and me are the only people that have access. You also need to upload your pages to AWS and include the URL. So you're not gonna be uploading any files this time to D2L. It's just a text submission where you put in Here's my repository link, and here is the link to my pages running on AWS. You have to submit the repository link on D2L as well. Yes, when you invite me through GitHub, GitHub does send me a notification, but many of you have cryptic GitHub usernames, so I don't necessarily know which GitHub user is which student. So you can't just rely on GitHub to send me the link. The link has to be attached to your submission on D2L. You have to do all your own work. This is not a group project. You can't give me the same work as somebody else. And if I question whether you've given me work that isn't yours, we will have a code review. Um, the work we've done in class, it's all up on GitHub. It's there for you to reference only. You can't download it, change the words, and give it back to me for your assignment and ask me to give you a grade. Okay. Um, if you do, I will probably know because I know how to recognize my own code. There's some screenshots at the bottom of this document. You can't build what's in the screenshot. It's only for demonstration purposes to show you the kind of application you need to build, but you can't just build a copy of what I have done. Right? Uh, one last thing, and I've heard that this has been an issue in some other classes. GitHub timestamps all of your commits. Once you submit your assignment to me, you can't go and modify your GitHub repository. I've had instances of this in the past. If you modify your GitHub repository after you've submitted the assignment, I'm gonna consider it academic misconduct because you've submitted it and then gone and done more work on the file, okay? Um, so everything is timestamped down to the microsecond, millisecond on GitHub. So don't make any changes to your repository, please, once you've submitted it be very easy for me to know. And I know from talking to some of my colleagues, this has been an issue already this semester in some other courses where people have submitted work, then changed their GitHub repository and then told their instructors that they weren't marked properly. Um, don't try that. So what are you going to build? You can build any kind of three page website that you want, so long as it meets the requirements outlined in the assignment. Okay, so I've given you some examples um, like registration and user list, a sports team manager, um, online music tracker. I suggest use PHP. Uh, Megan, I'll get to your question in just a second. Use PHP to build yourself a little application that you might actually use. Okay, so these are just some examples. If you're really stuck and you have no idea what to build and you need some guidance, then send me an email and we can talk about it and I can help you figure something out. Okay. But I'd rather you all choose what you're gonna build rather than me giving you giving everybody uh, the same project and me getting 40 copies of the exact same project. If you submit before the due date, Megan, um, yes, that's okay. But basically, once the due date is passed, you can't modify your repository. Okay, fair enough. Good question. Okay, so here's what you have to do. You'll need two tables in your database. You'll need a form to capture user input, and the form has to include a dropdown that's filled from a database like we did in class last week. You'll need to validate the user's input both on the form with client side 
HTML, as well as on the server with PHP. And we're going to do that today. Pretty simple, really. You're going to have a page that saves data to one of the database tables. And then you're going to have a page that's really similar to the lab one that you just completed that queries the database and outputs the data in a table, HTML table. Make sure you add some comments into your script as well. Okay. Um, you don't have to document every single line of code, but like each section, like what's going on in here. So you have two tables in the database uh, and they have different purposes. The first table is going to store the content from your HTML form. So much like in the, our, our lamp food, we have a, a table that stores the items. Your second table is going to be used to fill a drop down list that's included on the form. So one thing we're going to do with our application today, we're going to add a categories table. And then on our items form, we want to add a categories drop down. So when we're adding items to our grocery list, we can choose a category like produce or uh, seafood or dairy or something like that. So then you'll build a form that'll have, like we did two weeks ago, you'll have an input control for each field in the database. And then you'll have your drop down list that's populated from your other table. You use HTML5 input validation, which we'll look at today. We've played around with it a little bit, but we'll do a bit more. You'll then create a save page that takes the form post, checks that all the values are correct, will show any error messages to the user if they haven't filled out the form correctly. Again, we're going to do this today. And if everything is all correct, we want to save all the information to the table in your database. And then your third page is going to be like lab one. It's just going to show, it's going to select the data from the main table. Anything saved from the form is going to be displayed on that page. You need to deploy your pages to AWS. I think everybody already should know how to do that from Scott's class. Uh, most people did this for the lab. There were a few people who didn't upload their pages to AWS or include the link. It is a requirement for the assignment. And if you need help with that, the instructions are on D2L inside the weekly learning. There's a whole step-by-step -step instruction of how to upload and load your pages from AWS. On GitHub, so you're going to create a private repository, add me. So I will just show you where you do that. So we go to GitHub. You've probably done it already. So once you create the repository as a private repository, you click on settings. You go to manage access, GitHub will ask you to confirm your password, and then you invite a collaborator and you just put in my username. It doesn't find me because that's me and it comes up with my little avatar when you do. So that way your code is private, but I have access to it. Uh, someone's doc feeling like Dr. Phil today. Doing a little counseling, lending somebody an ear. Another cat, lots of cats today. In your GitHub repository for full marks, you need to make at least four commits and they should have descriptive names. So we'll talk about this later today. We don't want to be calling them commit one, commit two. Each commit should describe what changes you made to the code base. And you also need to create a readme file that describes the application and includes a link to the AWS site. Um, did you create a readme file when you did GitHub with Jarrett or is that new? Okay. Well, today will be the last day that you don't know what a readme file in for GitHub is and how to create. Pretty simple. So the file name will be readme.md. Really simple. I'll show you how to make it and what it does. Okay. So here's a sample application. Again, you can't build a copy of this. <laughs> I want you to build something else, but with this functionality. So there's three pages here. Here's my form. I've got input, so there's a players table in my database. And then I also have a drop down list. 
And my second table in the database is the positions table. So my form is used for saving new players, but the dropdown list, when I'm saving a player, I need to be able to pick a position for each player. So we're gonna add this into our LAMP food application today. We already have an items form, but we're gonna create a categories table and fill the categories dropdown. So when we save a grocery item, we can attach a category to it. So there's the first page is the form. My save page that just shows a message. If I filled out my form properly, and then the table, again, this is much like what we did in the lab, where it just selects all of the records that were saved to the database through the form. Okay, so I don't really care what your tables are, what your form is, just figure out what you wanna build. You know, you wanna build an application to keep track of all your assignments and their due dates at school, great. Uh, go and do that. You need a simple task tracker, you need a scheduler for your part-time job where you can just record your shifts. What day do you start? What um, How long is your shift? Whatever. Okay, so build something that you think might be a useful little PHP site for you to have. And again, if you need help figuring out, getting some ideas, then send me an email and I'll help you brainstorm and come up with something. So I use this rubric for marking, couple marks for your database tables, eight marks for saving a new record through your form correctly, eight marks for querying the data. So four marks are for building the table that shows the data from one of your database tables and four marks for using a PHP query to populate your dropdown list from the other table. And the dropdown list, it needs to be integrated into your form like this. I know in my class example, we did a form and then we did a dropdown list in a totally separate page. In the assignment, you have to combine them together. Okay. Eight marks for validating the data, both on the client and on the server when users are inputting new data, that they can't leave things blank and that they add in appropriate data types. Couple marks for using GitHub properly and commenting your code. If you want to add any additional features that we haven't learned in class that show PHP functionality, not CSS or JavaScript or HTML, but additional learning in PHP, I'll give you up to two bonus marks. If you want to enhance, you know, what I'm showing you here, this is like a 100% assignment. What I've shown, but if there's something else you want to do that shows independent learning with PHP, um, you can do that for bonus marks. Are there questions? It is due next week. Is there anything you're not clear about in terms of what you need to do or what I'm looking for? Okay, um, a deal, we can talk about that, but I guess, but maybe we can come back to that, if that's okay. Um, just while I have the assignment up, I just wanna make sure that I've clarified any questions um, or anything that's unclear about the assignment. Any questions at all about assignment one? Okay, I'm not seeing anything. Adil, you said questions plural. Um, what, I mean, we can open up 
I'm going to open up PHP Storm. Open up my project. While that's opening, I'm also going to open up XAMPP and start my local server. So, deal. I can try to address your questions. It sort of depends how many, <laughs> how many questions you have. I'm going to start my server. I'll open up our lamp food project. Adil, what specifically did you want to look at? I'll open up my items page. Okay. So you wanted to look at fetch all. So we see fetch all here. Right. Okay. So, and what's your question about fetch all? I guess I, and I need to my so my page failed because I have not connected to my VPN so we can't access the database so I will just right click open VPN and connect and now my item should load excuse me Okay, in that case, so if we have multiple queries, we would call fetch all each time. So if let's say we had three queries, we would connect once, we'd leave our connection open, but then this code we would be repeating because we would need different SQL commands. So we'd run them in sequence. Um, not with fetch all, no, it's going to, it's going to execute one single command, one single SQL statement. So fetch all is only going to run one query. So if you have multiple queries, you need, you would need to repeat this code, but change the SQL query each time. And we may have pages where we do that, where we're querying more than one thing. The other possibility is if we our queries can be joined. Our tables can be joined, we can write a single query. So for example, if items and categories are linked, it's possible to query them together to get the matches between items and categories in a single query. The more advanced kind of query which you guys are going to look at in your database class. Does that answer your question? Okay. All right, so our pages are my grocery list is back now. Um, so let's see, we had our item details, our PHP. Um, okay, we're going to deal with the validation first. So we've actually done it a little bit already. I'm going to open up, so I'm going to close all my files except for item details. Um, so we've actually done some validation here already. We've got required, 
and we've said type equals number. So if I try to save right now, that's good. But our validation isn't complete. Um, can you think of anything else we should do on the form to validate it properly? Our validation is pretty good, but not perfect. How could a user give us bad input here? Ah, okay, right, because I could do that. Yep. What about in the quantity? Ivan, we could look at a restricted words array, yep. Um, well, we can't type, if I try typing, it does validate that. Yeah, Christopher, that's the one I was thinking of, right? If I do this, right now our validation is going to let me do that. Right? So inside the quantity, we probably want to set a minimum here. Um, Let's set the minimum of one, for example. So that's gonna prevent somebody from being able to enter a zero. So if I refresh now, it automatically says, nope, no good. And until I get to one, So that's our validation on the client. We're using some of the HTML5 validators to validate on the client. And in your assignment, you're gonna to need to add validators to your form as well to make sure you're getting appropriate inputs from your users, what fields are required, and then making sure we get the right, we get the right data types. Now, we can validate with HTML5 on the client, and that tends to work most of the time, but we still need HTML validation here as well on our save item page. Um, how come? If the form won't let me submit, unless I follow the rules, why would we also need to check for proper data on this page before we save? How could somebody possibly save incomplete or invalid data when we've got these checks running on our form. Yeah, Mason, you're on the Mason, you're on the right track. Can you explain a bit more how it could work? Could be. Yep, so that's one issue. Is it possible for somebody to access the save page directly? Could be, Megan. Could somebody send data directly to the save page and somehow bypass our form? Yeah. So there's a few ways we could do it. Well, there's an even easier, right, Mason, you're right. So here, I'm gonna show you how I could do it. I'm gonna use an HTTP tool. So I've got this tool, we're gonna to use it next semester called Postman, it's a free tool. It's mostly used for integrating, uh, testing web APIs, so web services that have no front end. But then there's many other tools like this. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'll show you how it works. So normally, it's used – 
So normally it's used like this, right? This is a public API. I can send an HTTP GET request and it returns a bunch of data. So a lot of developers have these tools, but what if I do this? I'm going to make a POST request with no body to my save item. What will happen if I try and submit this? So I'm not using the form at all, right? Our form has HTML validators, but I'm gonna send a post request directly to the save item, yeah, deal by the URL or Mason by the link. So what will happen in my database? If I load this page directly by using Postman, but I don't provide any name or quantity. Let's try it. I'll send it. I got an OK response. And now if I go and look at my items, um, OK, I think our database may have blocked it because we said that the name couldn't be null. Okay, so we did get, I'll do it this way, form data, key is name, value is empty, and quantity, and I'll put in ABC, or actually negative three. So I send my request, it says my item was saved. And now I've basically gotten around the validation in my form because I've submit saved data directly through this HTTP tool. So it's good we have the validation on the form, but it's not enough. We also need the validation in our save page and in your assignment, I want you to do that as well. Now, so for now, what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna temporarily take out the HTML validators from our form. I'll put them back in after, but we wanna take them out so we can write and test our server side validation, make sure it's working, and then we can re-enable them. So I've just removed the required attribute on line 12 and you can do this in your form as well. And I've removed the required type and min attributes of quantity. So there's no validation at all now. So if I save that and return to the browser, now I can just save a completely blank item Right now, I've got a completely blank item at the bottom. So take out the required attribute, take out the type equals number, and take out the min. So our form is open, no restrictions. And then we want to go to the save item page. And before we connect to the database, and save a new item and show a message, we wanna do some validation checking. So we wanna make sure that the name is not empty and that the quantity is numeric and greater than one. And I mean, writing these kind of decisions in PHP, it's basically the same syntax you would use in Java um, so we have the same kind of decision structure. So we've got an if, if else, we've got switch statements. Um, so we're gonna use a couple if statements 
to check that our name is good and our quantity is good. And if either one of them isn't, we want to show a message to the user and we don't want to bother connecting and saving. So we are going to validate inputs before saving. So we're going to check them one at a time. I know we only have two, so it could be simple enough to check them at the same time. But typically, our forms, as they get longer, it can get too complicated to check multiple conditions all at once. So I find validation is simpler when we check one field at a time. So we want to check the name variable and make sure we have some kind of value here. Have any suggestions of what? We're going to use some built-in functions to check and make sure that name isn't empty. Uh, OK, so Mason, you want to check? We could say if it's not an empty string, not equal to. Megan suggests it's null. Uh, yeah, you know what? A lot of these would work. There's also a built-in function in PHP called empty. We can use that as well. So all your suggestions, those are good suggestions as well. Megan, I don't think there is an is null in PHP. Oh, OK. There is an is null. So we could use that. Uh, Ivan, you can do equals equals true, but you don't need it because it's a Boolean. It's implied. So the equals equals true is optional and typically not actually written that way. So if our name is null, we want to echo out um, So we're going to print out a message that says name is required. We want to make sure that the quantity is not null. Um, Good question, Neil. Uh, yeah, Neil, a deal. There's a trim function as well. So we could also trim it. So first trim it. That would get rid of any leading or trailing spaces. Yeah, Mason, that's just a line break. In case we need to print multiple messages, we'll print a message, each message on its own line. Good question. Thank you. So if quantity is null, we can echo. So if they didn't enter any quantity, we'll return a message saying the quantity is required. If it's not null, we now want to do two more checks, right? We want to check that it's numeric and that the value is one or higher. So we can say if not is numeric. Uh, yeah, Megan, th without that slash, so all HTML tags need a closing. So this indicates it's a self-closing tag, so it should have that. Yeah, that's right, Ivan. So the output is the same, but this is the considered the correct 
HTML format. So if we have a quantity, but it's not a number, we're going to say give a message. And then an else, and then one more check. If it is a number, we want to make sure that number is greater than one. If our quantity is less than one, So there's basically one potential error with the name, sorry, with the name, but there's three potential issues with the quantity, that it's not included, if it is included, that it's not a number, and if it is included and it is a number, that that number is less than one. So we want all of these checks. So what will happen if we submit the page now and let's say we leave both name and quantity blank? If I try the page right now, what will happen? I will put the code up shortly and we're almost due for a break. What will happen if we try this right now? So remember, we've disabled. It'll say input, but it's not. Well, I guess we could try it out and see. So let's go back to our form. So I'm going to leave it blank. So it tells me quantity must be a number. Our null for name, our null check didn't work, interestingly. So I think it evaluates to an empty string, but not null. But if I look in my database, if we look at the items page, it's still saved. Why did it still save? Right, I had an error message. Why does it save to the database even when I got this message? How come all of this code still seemed to execute? Connect to the database, insert my values, execute the query. Thank you, Christopher. We are checking the values and showing error messages, but there's no decision, right? We're not stopping anything. We're only printing an error. So what would we need to do? How can we control whether this code happens or doesn't happen? There's a few different ways of doing this. Yeah, Mason, that's exactly what I was thinking. Yep, Jacob, we could use die. I like the, uh, yep, we could make it its own function which runs if it's true. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna create one more variable up here. I'm gonna create a flag like Mason suggested. I'll call it okay. Now this didn't quite work, this is null. I'm going to change this to use the empty function. So if we trim our name and it's empty, what should we do with OK? Is our OK variable still true if the name is empty? Right. Let's toggle it to false. I want to do the same thing in all of our other error conditions.
Uh, well, I'm initializing it to true right away. And once I encounter an error, I'm changing to, to false. If you prefer to do it the other way, Mason, yeah, absolutely, you can do it that way. So I'm assuming things are okay until I encounter an error. And anytime I encounter an error, I'm gonna say the form is not okay. I think I'm also gonna replace quantity that is null with an empty here because is null didn't seem to give us what we were looking for. I think it gave us an empty string, treats it like a string. So now here, I'm going to wrap this whole thing. I can just say if, okay. And because it's a Boolean, I don't need equals equals true. And I'm going to move all of this code inside it. Include right up into and including the echo command. So all of this stuff only happens So all the code to connect and save is now wrapped in my OK. So we're not going to save if any error happened. So now I'm going to try this out. And now if the validation fails, we should get error messages and nothing should get saved to the database. I already have two empty ones in the database. So I'm gonna try this again. So now if name is empty and quantity, I'll put it as, I don't know, minus 11. So it says name is required, quantity must be greater. And if I look in the database, now it doesn't save, which is what we wanted. Um, when I put a name in, it says quantity must be greater than zero. If I leave the quantity out, it tells me it's required. And when I finally put in a proper quantity, it tells me it's saved. So now we're validating on the server in PHP. So even if someone tries to go around our form by the URL and send bad data, we're still checking. And now I'll put my validation back in my form. Okay. We'll add it back in now. Okay. It's five to three. I'm going to push my changes up to GitHub. So you can refer to them if you need. I'll throw the link in the chat, although it's already on D2L. Um, and we'll come back in 10 minutes and we'll do some more with this. So lesson 41. Uh, Okay, here's your link. If you need any of the code we've done so far today, it is on GitHub for you. I'm going to take a break and we'll come back in 10 minutes.